My name is Drew Pulaski. I go to Carleton College. Um, in the summer, I was working uh, with Dr. Ellenson and Neil Hagen on characterizing the localized surface plasma resonance in iron sulfide. Um, so first off, just to talk a little bit about iron sulfide. Um, the reason we're curious about iron sulfide uh, it's a semiconducting material with a band gap that would make it a pretty good material for solar cells. Uh, it's readily available. Um, there's a picture of some that was mined in Spain. Uh, it's fairly cheap to process, um, and com especially compared to a lot of the other thin film solar technologies, it's non-toxic and doesn't have a lot of the same environmental impacts. So, if we could make solar cells out of it, it would be great. Um, but there's some issues with that, um, which tie into the surface plasma resonance. Um, so, as you could, can see from this picture, uh, it has this metallic appearance. Um, and so, that's probably caused by the um, surface plasma resonance. So, what that is, is basically charge carriers um, mostly associated with sulfur vacancies in the material. Uh, as light is absorbed in the material, the charge carriers, it oscillates these charge carriers in a coherent wave. Um, and what that means, at least as far as uh, using this in the solar cell, uh, it changes the wavelengths that are absorbed and effectively reduces the and gap energy in this material to the point where it really couldn't be used effectively or efficiently in solar cells. Um, so the goal of the research this summer was to figure out how, uh, how this plasmon reacts in various different dielectric conditions uh, and see if we can do anything to minimize the plasmon effects. Um, so, we started out with three samples. Um, the first sample there, uh, using one millimeter of the, um, the ligand topo, uh, synthesized in the air, so with oxygen present. Um, the second two were both synthesized in nitrogen, so without oxygen. And the different amounts of the ligand mean that the uh, the black line there will be the largest crystals, the other two will have smaller crystals. So this is an initial, initial uh, absorption spectrum that was taken um, immediately after synthesis. Uh, this was carried out before I got here by uh, him and Zareshki. Um, so one interesting thing to note here is the sample that was synthesized in air displayed a much larger uh, plasma peak than the other two, um, which I'll get back to why that's interesting a little later. Um, so this is, the, this is the black line on the previous um, slide in a variety of solvents. Um, with, in all of these cases, there's a pretty clear plasmon peak um, that shifts as we change solvents. Uh, here's a, the smaller crystal sample. Um, that was synthesized with nitrogen. Once again, it's a pretty clear plasmon, um, but the peak location is much, the changes are contracted. Um, so then just to plot the peak energies uh, versus the dielectric constant, uh, you can see that there's a consistent trend uh, between dielectric constant and peak energy, which pretty well confirms that this is a plasmon effect that we're seeing. Um, the, because of the way, because it's a, um, the plasmon effect effectively is a electric wave on the surface of the material. So changing the dielectric environment um, alters how the wave propagates across the material, uh, which is why we would expect to see a trend like this. Um, this is also somewhat interesting results as uh, we would hope to be able to increase this peak energy 
um, to be able to use it in a solar cell. Um, and we can see that it does increase, but also levels off, so it's not clear through methods like this how much we could really uh, increase that peak energy. Um, and then, so that was four of the solvents behaved nicely. Uh, the fifth, chloroform, did not. Um, so chloroform has a dielectric constant of 4.8, which puts it about in the middle uh, of the solvents we used, but it shifted peak uh, the furthest to the high energies. Um, and we're not really sure what caused that. We're guessing there's some other interaction between the nanocrystals and the solvent going on, uh, but we're not really sure what's what's causing that at this point. Um, so after doing these, uh, doing the experiments with the solvents, I also made um, some films of the of the nanocrystals. Um, so. These made three films from each of the samples. Um, the first film was heated uh, in air to allow it to oxidize. Uh, the second film was heated in nitrogen to control for changes from the heating, but not from oxidation. And then the third film was not heated, um, just as a control. Um, it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but uh, so these are the two. F these would be the films that were heated in air, and they took on a much more golden color um, than the rest of the films after heating. Um, so here's the absorption spectra for these films. Um, the control, as you can see, didn't change, which is good. Um, the film that was heated in nitrogen changed a little bit. Um, we're thinking that was probably due either to annealing of the crystals or the um, or the ligand evaporating off further, which would uh, change the dielectric environment for the films. Um, but we saw a large shift for the sample that was heated in the air, uh, and that was the only one that had a, had a very had an actual shift in the band gap. Uh, this oxidation raised it from about 0.4 electron volts to about 1.18 electron volts, um, which is a promising result. Um, this 1.18 electron volts would be a pretty good value for a solar cell material. Um, so that was for the larger crystals. This is for the smaller crystals. Um, once again, we don't see much change for the sample heated in nitrogen. Um, but here, the sample heated in air still does change, but it's a much smaller shift. Um, and the post-heating, um, rather than having the nice um, cutoff and absorbance, kind of trails off upwards here. Um, we're not exactly sure what caused it to do that, as opposed to sticking with the showing a good knee, so to speak. Um, so one interesting thing to note is that, as you can see from the films, they don't show the same plasma on peak, um, where it peaks in the infrared and then declines back uh, in absorbance. Um, and we're not exactly sure why. Um, that's a fairly surprising result for this. Um, so more research is going to have to be done in that. Um, but even without showing that plasma on peak, the band gaps of most of the samples are shifted much lower than you would expect um, for pyrite. Um, and then the oxidation that we did did shift the band gap energy higher um, by a varying degree based on crystal size, it appears. But we'll have to do more tests to really uh, figure out how that effect is working. Um, so from this research, we can pretty safely say that pyrite is displaying uh, a localized surface plasmon resonance. Um, the oxidation of the films is reducing that effect, um, but it's not exactly clear to what extent. Um, other things we could try 
and I'll be synthesizing it with a different ligand. Um, the topo that was used here has a dielectric constant of about 2.6. Um, so if we use a ligand with a different dielectric constant, that could alter the peak that we see. Um, and also, with the films, there's pretty clear differences between the different crystal sizes. Um, so trying different quantities of ligands to get different sized crystals could have interesting results. Um, so thanks to Paimon for preparing the samples. Uh, Neil yeah, Hopkin uh, for helping me run the experiment, uh, my mentor Randy Ellison, and the uh, University of Toledo and NSF. Yes. A couple of questions. Um, so, first question is how would, how did you determine the band gaps? Um, so, I took the. Uh, Took the uh, energy multiplied by the absorbance um, and took the square root of that, plotted over the energy um, to determine, uh, gave a function with a couple of linear portions um, and took the basically extrapolated a line from that first from the first linear portion on that plot. Uh, to find where it crossed the axis and to that energy as the band gap. Okay. So, so I guess the thing that's confusing is that you started off by saying that iron sulfide had a band gap of 0.948, mm -hmm. and then you should, I, I can't remember what you have for the films, but for these crystals you have a very different band gap, right? Yeah. Um, it's getting that, higher, then it's, it's getting higher than your so it's just very confusing. Yeah, um, so that <laughs> initial band gap that I quoted, um, just from literature for bulk um, pyrite. Um, so, I guess it, so I guess if your thin films were good bulk pyrite, then you would get 0.948, d but something going on, some defects or something going on that changes that, right? Yeah, it seems that way. But I guess the other question I had was, when you, since, you're doing absor since you were initially doing absorbance to look for the surface plasma and resonance, mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me that whether you're actually seeing the band gap or the surface plasma on the surface of that. Whether uh, you're seeing the bulk material inside that's under the surface or you're just probing the surface. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we don't really 